The title this morning is Identity and we've had a couple of messages already. I think this is the fourth one and I'm wrapping up the first part of, of this whole message called Church Alive and I am dealing with the subtext of destiny and purpose and I've just put the phrase there, what on earth am I here for? That's a challenge we all face and I'd like to answer that. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna ask five questions and I'm gonna give five answers. So in a way, uh, I think we're gonna reason a little bit this morning. We're gonna deal with this question. And question number one, the question of identity. Who am I? Can you imagine somebody comes to you and asks you, so tell me, who are you? It's one of the most awkward questions. And then you say to the person, listen, uh, I'm an architect. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I am a hairdresser. And the person says, no, 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 not your job. Who are you? <laughs> and then you try something else. You say, no, no, um, I'm a mother. I like to tell people I'm a grandfather of nine grandkids and, and, and you know, uh, I live in East London and the person says, no, no, I'm not asking you the roles you play. Who are you? <laughs> and then you're stuck because how do you describe yourself? And this is the whole thing of identity. Who am I? You, you know, I don't know who you've ever done a trick to go and look in the mirror and try and outstare yourself. I've done it. Yes, you start to look like, if you look long and hard enough, you feel like you're looking at a stranger. You think, who are you? Hey, you got crazy eyes. And then I intimidated myself by staring at myself. I've done that more than once. Because this is the question of identity. Who am I? Who are you? Okay, let me read a couple of scriptures quickly. So I think the way we're going to do it, I don't think whoever's going to try and put scriptures up there will keep up with me. Uh, I, I, think, I think why I'm going to read the scriptures, because I know you know scripture, and I'm just building the point. I'm giving it, I, I just want to give it credibility of what we're saying and reference. But these scriptures actually need meditation. They need each their time, but they're too many and I'm scared that I'm going to compound this message with too much data. So please just listen to what we're saying. The question is, where am I? Okay, so Genesis 1, 26, the first part says, then God said, let us, it's interesting that God would say that, eh? let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then in verse 27, he says, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so by the way, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Romans 8, verse 29, I'm reading the first part, says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. Remember, we're asking the question, who am I? And then Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 5 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And then there's one in Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So just considering these texts and many others, we can therefore safely say that our primary identity is to be an image bearer of God who created us. That's going to be the answer. And the world today doesn't help us because they label us. And you can imagine if in the office somebody tried to ask you or you had to write your CV and you put there, 
I am a son of the living God and I'm bearing the image of God who's created the heavens and the earth. People will look funny at you, but that's the truth. If, if you can't settle that as your identity, then you're going to battle. Then, then who are we really? You know, so, but I also need to say to you, this whole idea got messed up when man sinned. He traded this identity for something the devil came and crooked man. He kind of asked questions. He suggested that God was kind of hiding something from man and then man and the whole thing got marred. And that's what we battle today with. Brokenness in ourselves, brokenness in the world, identity problems, high suicides, people need substance to cope. Can you imagine if every human being knew that he was a son and a daughter of the living God created in the image of God and has the, a God living in him, we would not have all this. So this is fundamentally the gospel we preach, that Christ came to reconcile us back into the position we originally had and who we are. I'm a son of God. So, I think I should just stop right there on this first point. My notes have got more. Question number one, five questions. This is the first question. The question of identity, who am I? The answer is, I am a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. And you know what? People who don't even know Christ are also children of God. They're just estranged. They need to be reconciled back to God. So you become, so that you can draw from God and be restored in your image. That's the message we bring to a broken world, the good news. You see what religion has done, is said, you know what, you're disqualified. Your sin is too big. There's a whole lot of things you're gonna have to do. You're gonna jump through hoops like crazy. And then whilst doing it, you're still going to feel like inadequate. The gospel comes and says, God knows we couldn't fix this problem, so he sent his son. A son who came and represented him. He says the son was the full representation, exactly looked like the father. And the son comes and he says, I will in your stead come and take your sin and everything that, that disqualified you. If you believe in him, God says, I will swap my righteousness for your sin. And I will restore you that you can become exactly who I intended you to be. That's the good news. So who am I? I'm a son of God. I'm an image bearer of the living God. That was God's plan from the beginning. Hallelujah. Three more questions. Question two, three, and four comes from Rick Warren's purpose-driven life thing. We did that many years ago. Can you remember, Jen? And there were three questions that I brought in here. So I, I did the first, I bring in these three, and then I'll put another one there because we're busy asking the question around why am I here for, what's my purpose, what is my destiny? What did God have in mind when he made me? So question number two is the question of existence. Why am I alive? It's a big question. <laughs> Why am I alive? And Jeremiah asked the same question thousands of years ago. And as we read in Jeremiah 20 verse 18. Why was I born, he says. Was it only to have trouble and sorrow to end my life in disgrace? A lot of people feel like that. Even Christians. So what does God want from us here? Why are we alive? Why are we on this planet? Is there a reason? You know, Proverbs 16.4 says, the Lord has made all for himself, or the Lord has made all for his own purpose. Very clear answer. So it is for his purpose that God has made us, and nothing that he made is without a purpose. 
even this mic, your shoes, the chair that you have. And I want us to look behind God's motive. Let's just go for a moment and just look behind the motive of the creator, the designer. Because we're asking the question, why am I alive? And, 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 and we said that God has got a purpose for everything. So what was his motive? Ephesians 1 verse 4. That's what we studied. Remember the first half of the year, and we're busy going back to it. I'm going to read from the message translation. It's a bit of a free translation, but it helps a little bit to grasp the point I want to make. It says, long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. That thought is a bit big. He says, he had settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. God had us in mind from the beginning. But he says here as well, we were the focus of his love. So the answer is, why am I my life? The answer is simply, we are created to be loved by God. Think about it. Um, Linda's not here this morning. She's got a whole lot of proofreading to do, and she's battling through a whole book, 160 pages, that she needs to finish sometime today. But this is a strange thing. You know, I watch my wife. I'm, I'm, I'm less emotional than Linda. So we had a visit from our daughter from Bahrain, and her husband and the three kids. And then we just went to Pretoria and we saw the other two grandkids. So we saw five of our grandkids that don't live here and we don't see them often. Yeah, my wife has messed up after those visits for a long time. She's emotionally, I, I don't know what to do with my wife. Maybe you must, guys, guys must help me. And send your kids to a hugger. She, you know what Linda tells me? She says, I, I miss thy lafies. In English, I just, I just need to hug those little bodies. And so the, 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 my question to us is, why do we have even kids? Some kids think their parents have kids so that they've got slaves, you know, to wash the dishes and, <laughs> and wash the car. You know, some of us were raised like slaves, right? But why do you want a child anyway? And why do you want grandkids anyway? You know why? Because you, you want to love them. So is that too a theological answer for you? If I'm asking you today the question of why I'm alive and I want to say it to you so that God could love you. <laughs> That's a big one as far as I'm concerned. Because if you can settle that one, I'm loved by God, you deal with a lot of identity issues in your heart. Listen, God, it's not like he needed us. It's not like God said, I am half broken and I'm lonely here in heaven. I need some people. No, no, no. He didn't create us out of need or to complete himself. God is already fully complete. He made us so that he could love us. So that was the answer to question number two. The question of existence, why am I alive? I'm alive because God, because God loves us, because God, so that we could be loved by God. That is, and that goes for you, sir, and ma'am, and everybody else. Okay, let's go back to that mirror again. Stare in it, give yourself a wink, and then you say, hey Marius, God loves you. And I like you too. <laughs> Just give it a go. There are too many people who feel unloved. Yes, feel totally unloved. And let me tell you, every lie that suggests rejection comes from the enemy, the devil, would like to bring a lie because he knows if he somehow can plant a seed in your heart that you feel unloved by God and people, he just isolates you from the living God. You will believe in God, but you won't let him love you. You won't have a connection with him. Okay, so let's fight the devil. 
I like what one preacher said. It sounds like a swear word, but he said to hell with the devil. <laughs> Sorry for that, but that's how I feel myself. Okay, question number three. The question of significance. Does my life matter? Now, I know I'm alive by God, but does my life matter? If I'm not there, will anybody miss me? Will, you know, does my life matter? Isaiah 49 verse 4 says, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is Isaiah. says, I replied, but my work seems so useless. I've spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose. Yet I have it all in the Lord, I leave it all in the Lord's hands. I will trust God for my reward. These prophets battle the same battles as us, it seems. But the answer is, you and I were made for meaning. And if you don't put any meaning or purpose into your life, while you're on this planet, life will not make sense at all. I don't know if you ever heard the story, but there's a story that during World War II, there were prisoners in a Nazi concentration camp in Hungary that were processing, guess what they processed? Human waste, human sewage. They worked the honeysucker. And then the Allies came along, bombed the factory, and blew it apart. So the prisoners had nothing to do. The Nazi soldiers had the prisoners take all the rubble of the factory and move it to another field. The next day, they had them take the same rubble and move it back to, in reverse. The next day, they had to take the stuff and move it back, and day after day, they had no meaning, no purpose. It was just work done the same, it was just work doing the same thing over and over with no meaning and no purpose. Then something strange began to happen. The prisoners become, became crazy. They began to lose their will to live because there was no meaning, no purpose in their work. This, this is recorded. This is what really happened. They were just moving bricks back and forth, back and forth. Many of them began to throw themselves in front of the guards trying to get shot. And effectively, they were trying to commit suicide. Why? Because meaning was taken. When they were moving human waste, there was still enough purpose in their lives that kept them willing to live. Well, here is... Uh, I gave some questions for discussions as well, and this one will be one of them. So all of us are going through life at one of three, or three levels, and you will see yourself. I'll just present these three levels to you because we are busy dealing with the question of significance. Does my life matter? So the first level where people might live their lives would be called survival level. You are just barely getting by. You are just existing. You are not living. You are controlled by your circumstances. Some people would give a testimony of their lives exactly like that. In other words, they live life at a survival level. Then you get another level. Let's call it the success level. These are people whose life is basically comfortable in comparison to the rest of the world. There's money in your bank account. You eat food three times a day. You have a car, you have possessions, you have freedom, uh, you have good health, and you may have prestige even, and you, may be, and you may be quite successful. That is called a success level, but you may be saying the following, I'm so successful, why don't I feel fulfilled? Have you ever noticed these super rich people like Oprah Winfrey, Bill Gates, and others, they come to a stage where they're not happy with their success. They start to give away like 80, 90% of their stuff so that they can find significance because it seems that success does not fulfill. So some people actually are on this success level, but they have this hole in themselves. Church does not make sense. Nothing makes sense. You can end up querying God, the church, everything and everybody when you find yourself in this place. And then there is the significance level. Um, and this is how you get there in, in three basic ways. You 
is when you know the meaning of life. It's also when you know how much you matter to God. And also when you know God's purpose for your life and you are living out that purpose. So obviously, all of us would like to live our lives at the level of significance. And that's what we're busy talking about. The question of significance is, does my life matter? I'd like again to read, I'm gonna read three scriptures and draw a thought from there. And I'm gonna try and leave you with another thought. Can you remember the previous one, why am I alive? And the answer was, so that God can love me. Okay, so let's see what this question then would be. Does my life matter? Let's see what answer will come up for that one. Isaiah 44 verse two says, I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. Hmm, that sounds good. Hmm. Okay. Psalm 139.16. This one even goes further. It says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Okay. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Okay. This is either true or not true, right? Psalm 33, 11. But his plans endure forever. His purposes last for eternity. Okay, so the question, does my life matter? I'm going to try and propose an answer towards this. God says, I have plans and purposes for your life. I even recorded them before it even happened. Right? Think about that. But then, let's therefore go through your phase of life, and then we need to say, it does not end when you die. You have to bring that perspective in. It does not end when you die. So, you were made to last forever. This is quite an interesting answer to the question, does my life matter? And the answer is your life matters because you've made, been made for all eternity. Because if you just had to live, and you know, think about our kids, how they have to navigate school and stuff. You go to school and you are presented. I mean, my, my grandkids are fascinated by, um, what, are, what are these guys called? Yeah, and dinosaurs. I mean, they know every guy. They know what they eat and don't eat, and a T-Rex and a dinosaurus and, and this, a try, try this, and a, I can't remember none of those names. They know everything, but with that, and I believe they did exist because the skeletons are there, but they also presented with the idea of evolution, that there was no creator God. And I wonder how we as parents counter what our kids hear and the seed that is planted that actually if you believe that there is no design behind you and that everything just ends into nothingness, how on earth would you ever answer the question, does my life matter? You can't. Hence, this is what we say here. So one of the biggest ways that you can actually waste your life is to think that all there is is the here and the now. You're going to spend far more time on the other side of death than you're going to do on this side. I like funerals. Because I can preach the gospel in a way that I can't in any other time. And I like to tell people, the way you grieve is an indication how you're going to face your own death. <laughs> it's like an insurance agent. I mean... Somebody dies, have an accident, they can sell to the whole family. So just think about it. You were made for eternity and this life is a preparation for eternity. That perspective does not, it does not operate in the Western world much. But it's part of why my life matters. There is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I'm going to rule and reign with Christ for all eternity. And somehow this life influences the life to come. The Bible speaks of inheritance and rewards. 
So life matters. Why? Because I've been created for eternity and this life is a preparation for all eternity. Therefore, this life matters. If it is just about this, how would you argue that life matters? Hallelujah. Okay, let's go for question number four. The question of intention. What is my purpose? Like I said, what on earth am I here for? Probably the greatest atheist philosopher of the last century by the name of Bertrand Russell, he was an Englishman, he said the following, unless you assume the existence of God, the question of life's meaning and purpose is irrelevant. This is what the atheist philosopher said. If there's no God, if you are just a chance of nature, if your life does not matter, but there is a, but, but the answer is there is a God. And God made you for a reason. And he made you for a purpose. The only way you're going to know your purpose is to know him. There is no shortcut. You have to get to know him so that you can get to know yourself. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that life, that life will never make sense. It won't. And I'm always thinking, how are we raising our children? Somehow your doctrine and your belief system is not in your head. It's what your kids believe. And you know what I'm realizing? The test of what my kids know is what my grandkids know. When I see my grandchildren do things or not do things, I realize it comes from the way we mentored and discipled our children. I would say those who raise children Think of the curriculum. Think of what things you talk about. Every child would somewhere in their discovery journey would ask questions like, where do I come from? Why was I made? Who's God? My one grandchild asked, um, little Eli asked Charlene the other day, does Jesus wear underpants? <laughs> That was a deep theological question, I think. <laughs> Don't sidestep it. Because somehow, how are you going to answer that question will start to form the child's thinking about God. <laughs> I'm sure that all he wanted to do was avoid wearing underpants himself. Because if he could prove that Jesus was not wearing underpants, he doesn't have to wear underpants. Because he somehow knows in their family, Jesus is the hero. <laughs> He's the standard. I didn't know what Eli was thinking. He's a curious boy. <laughs> My little son, grandson Adam, when I was ill, came to me and said, Opa, can I pray for you? He laid his hands on my leg and he prayed for me. The next day he came, he says, how's your leg? <laughs> it was pretty much still the same. Uh, how do we deal with this, <laughs> with this truth? I said, I think God is busy healing my leg, Adam. He says, okay, let me just pray for you again then. <laughs> I'm saying, please don't consume for yourself here this morning. The things we're talking about here are so important. Why do, why do I exist? Why am I made? Hmm? To be loved by God. I'm a child of God. I'm created in His image. I've been created for eternity. These are big thoughts. They are massive theological thoughts. They're simple. And I'm trying to make it simple here this morning that we can all understand. But how will you help your child? And I want to I suggest to you, don't ambush them. They're going to ask you this question anyway. If you have enough conversation with your child, these questions will come up. 
And you could ask a question and you can have an amazing discussion. And you can help establish the theology of your child. Statistically, what people believe, most people believe in the adult years was established in the youth, in the child, in the children. If we miss our children, we miss our greatest opportunity for evangelism and teaching the next generation. The problem what we now have is we produce a generation that are skeptic. Very skeptic. Spoke to a German exchange students the other day and when I spoke about Jesus they start laughing I says do you also believe those old tales but you know what happened as we started to interact with them there was a gap in that specifically one young girl there was a gap in her heart she needed a dad and we just loved her and as we kept on loving her kept on smiling she opened the conversation can you just talk a little bit about this Jesus guy you're talking about because what she needed was love. The theology in her mind belonged to the old generation. It's part of, like children. I remember when I grew up, I had to figure it out because it was Liva Jesus, Liva Axie, Father Christmas, the Thunder Mace. It was the Tooth Fairy. It was fairies. It was Father Christmas. It was all these guys and then Jesus. They were all in one category in my mind as I grew up. I had to be shaped and formed by my parents and their discussion and the theology at home, identity, purposed. We need to raise a generation of young people that know what God had in mind when he made them. How can you send a young person from your home into life and they don't know these things? Or is our plan to drop them at church and hopefully the Sunday school teacher will do it for us? I'm speaking like a granddad now. What I'm saying this, you're not just consuming today for a point in an argument. Think about creative ways. We can establish this in the soul, in the mind, in the heart of a young generation. Hallelujah. Okay. So I said, you'll get to know your purpose when you get to know the one who made you. Logically speaking, any product, you need to speak to the inventor, the creator, or you have to look at the owner's manual to know what, how does this whole thing work. And I want to suggest you, it's as simple as that. When you want to figure out the purpose of your life, why you are here, you need to be able to speak to the one who made you, and you need to look at his owner's manual. The word of God gives us everything. That's why we disciple people, teach people in God's word. Hallelujah. Okay, so this is actually, if you think about it, this whole Church Alive series where we talk about identity, where we're going to talk about how we fit into the body of Christ. We're going to talk about the gifts and the stuff that God has put in you. It's all about this stuff we're talking about. It's identity and purpose and function. That's the journey we're on. It's an exciting journey. Hallelujah. Okay, so also to understand when, you, when we talk about purpose, you need to realize that when it comes to purpose, there's something primary and general. And there's also something specific and secondary. What I mean by that is this. I love this church's vision statement or mission statement. We are a diverse people, united in Christ. We are there to advance God's kingdom. The way we're going to do that is we're going to live the way Jesus showed us to live and we're going to influence other people to do the same. That lines up beautifully what the word of God tells us. So our primary, there's a primary purpose. And I'm going to, I'm going to present it to you now what the Bible says. But secondary to that, God also gives us unique assignments. And towards the end, when I do the fifth question, I'm going to try and unlock that quickly so that we understand because somehow God made you to fit into the bigger plan with your uniqueness as well. Hallelujah. Let's quickly do that. I would like to present to you five purposes. This is what Rick Warren did those days. I, I think it holds water. I think it's beautifully put out and it makes sense. He actually took these five things from the great commandment and the great commission. 
The great commandment says we must love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our strength as we love ourselves and we must also love our neighbor just like we love ourselves. And then with the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. The way you're going to do it is go and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have to teach them everything that Christ taught you. Okay, so he took those two and put it together and came up with five purposes. And I'm going to present them to you quickly. It will be on the, on the, um, on the screen. And the question is, the question of intention. What is my purpose? So number one, I was planned for God's pleasure. And the Bible word for that is worship. That's to know and to love God. So I can't now because each of these is a sermon in itself. And I, 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 time is going to catch up with me very quickly here. So if you want to ask the question, so why was I made? What's my purpose? You are made for God's pleasure and you express it through worship. Okay, worship can be songs, it can be anything that gives, where you reflect that image you carry. So a good deed is worship. Being kind is worship. Being integrous is worship. To sing, raise a hallelujah is worship. Anytime you give God pleasure, every time you honor him, it's worship. Number two, I was formed for God's family. The Bible's word for that is fellowship. We must learn to love each other. It was God's plan that we not only love by him and we love him back, but that we also, he placed us in a family because God is a family God. That's why he's called father. Hmm? So that is important, fellowship. That's our purpose. There's nothing like a solo Christian. This thing, let me tell you, one of the biggest problems we have in church history is this. When the idea came that you can do it all by yourself, and there's clergy and there's laity. Listen, God's plan is that we live in community. You, a child can't raise itself, man. We put kids in orphanages. And if anybody here was raised in an orphanage or you were just raised by strangers, you t you'll come and tell us how hard it was to figure out your identity. So God, in his mind, created us for himself so that we could give him pleasure. Remember what he said of his son. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you know why I live? Why Marius Gratwell lives? One day, I'm going to meet Jesus, and all I want to hear, Jen, is, I, I just want a thumbs up from God. That's all I want. The rest, I don't care about. My, mo what drives me, what motivates me, is to please my Father. I don't work for money. I don't work for prestige. I don't work for any of those things. I want to please God. But the second thing, that's called worship. The second thing is fellowship. I know, I know that I know that I know I will not make it by myself. I'm in marriage and I honor my marriage. I'm in family and I honor and I honor the body of Christ. I honor every relationship and it must be part of, we've been, the purpose is to live in fellowship, in family, because God is the father of his family. It's our purpose. You know what, here's the secret. This is God's evangelism plan. His plan was that we live this Christian family life so good that the world gets jealous about how we live. Then they want to come and say, I also want this. That was act, that's actually God's plan. Family and church in God's plan is what people should be hungry for. That's why it's a high priority. Hallelujah. Number three, I was created to become like Christ. The Bible word for that is discipleship. To learn to become like Christ. Remember, we are preparing for eternity. Number four, I was shaped to serve God. The Bible word for that is ministry. 
to learn to use my resources, my gifts, my talents for God in serving him. And then number five, I was made for mission. The Bible word for that is evangelism, to be a witness of the saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the five things you could answer when somebody says, what is our primary purpose? Our primary purpose is to worship God, is to fellowship with my family, to represent God's household, to disciple and be discipled by becoming like Christ, to serve others and the world for the good works I've been prepared for, that God prepared in advance that I should do. That is called ministry, serving. It's the same word. And then I am on a mission because God says, you will be my witness. You will share the gospel of Christ. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is the proclamation of the good news of Christ. It's my purpose. You don't come and say, okay, I'll choose this one, this one, no, this one, no, this one, no, no. God, when he, he said hey, when he made us, he had an intention. But now here's another question, a big question that I would like to ask. And I call it the question of empowerment. How will I be able to do what God has designed and called me to do? Many years ago, we sat in a circle as a staff here. And remember, we had a series where we called it Camping Around God's Goodness. We had a whole thing. We, we, we sat in circles even here and we were camping around God's goodness. And then we asked the question, if money was not the issue, in other words, if you had enough money, is there anything that you are not doing for God that you want to do for God? And you know what? All of us came up and shared a dream that we were still not doing. And the reason why we're not doing the dream that God put within us because we were broke. We did not have enough resource for it. So here's the dilemma that we need to answer. My question is the question of empowerment. How will I be able to do this? And I, I, I present to you three things. Number one, we need God's permission. In other words, we need authority and we need God's backing. It will be very hard to do anything without God's backing. I need authority. I need to come in the name of Jesus. Because I know what I'm going to do is if God is not behind me, it's not going to work. The second one is, is, the, is I need God's power. I need his ability. Because the things that I need to do, I can't do in my human strength. And then lastly, I will need provision and I will need resources. If I can have those three things, God's authority, God's power, and God's resources, I can do anything for God. The only thing then lacking is willpower or willingness. There are lots of scriptures here. I can't read them all, but Genesis 1.28 speaks and it says, God blessed them and God said to me, fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion over it, rule over the fish and the animals and everything in the earth. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, therefore go. In other words, he delegates Authority, his absolute authority, he says, on the basis of my authority, I hereby authorize you. Luke 24, 46, 49, he says to the guys, essentially, I'm giving you this commission to go and preach the gospel, but I want you to wait in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. In other words, what God was saying simply, before you go and start, you need my power first. And then in Acts 1.8, he says, you shall receive power when my spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, right? And then in Ephesians 1 verse 19 to 23, he actually prays a prayer for their eyes to be opened to see what they have inside of them. And one of the things is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is also within us. And that Christ is seated and we are seated with Christ and where Christ is, he has an, a position of authority over every other authorities now and in future. And he says, I've done that for the benefit of the church. 
So he addresses in the scripture the issue of power and authority. It's clear from scripture he has given to us power and authority to fulfill our purpose, the things we've just discussed. And then Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in heavenly places. It's very clear that God is not withholding anything from us to fulfill what we need to do. And then 1 Peter 4, 10, he says, God has given each of us a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So I want to emphatically say, in terms of empowerment, you have received authority from God to use his power. And God says, you need to walk on a faith walk because I've given to you. Poverty is a mindset that you have. Don't shake it off. Trust me, believe me. I'm the God who multiplies fish and loaves. I'm the God who turns water into wine. Don't limit me. And I would say for many of us, we might understand all four, but we feel limited one or the other way. Hallelujah. So, okay, see how I can do this. I just want to leave us with a final thought. The thought around authority and power. When man sinned, that's what we lost. Satan took it away from us. When Christ died on the cross and he took those keys from the devil and he got the authority back, he gave it to us. So I would like to just quickly in your mind, very quickly, I just want you to grasp something and then we close. The Bible translates power as dunamis. That's where you get the word dynamite and dynamo from. Power is ability to do something. Okay? And that power comes by the Holy Spirit. This morning when we prayed, we believed that the God who has all power, who has authorized us to extend that power to do what only God can do. Authority is delegated from the source. And it simply means you have the right or the keys or the license to operate on his behalf with his resources and with his power to fulfill his outcome and his mandate. So the power is easy to understand. Authority is where the difficulty comes. For many of us, we get negative words when we hear authority. It feels abusive. Now, biblical authority is not something you have over other human beings. Nowhere in scripture does it suggest that authority means you have the right to abuse or dominate another human being. Nowhere. Your authority is equally in line with what the creator, the author, authorized you to do. So there are four words. The word author, where the word authority comes from. God is the author of life. He is the initiator. He is the creator. And therefore, he is the author, and he, through creation, he purposed you to be what we've discussed. For you to know that you can do what he's called you to do is the word authorize. It's delegated. Authority means it's what God has placed within you and commissioned you to do. That's your authority. This chair's authority is to be a chair. Your cell phone's authority is to be a cell phone. My authority is to be Marius. To do what he's called me to do and assigned me to do. So authority equals your assignment. It equals the purpose he's given you. That's the authority. When my authority 
And remember, I said God created us to work as a team, as work as a family, and that none of us can do it by ourselves. So when Vainant and myself work together, my authority submits to his authority, and his authority submits to my authority. Another way to say it, we need to work together. That's how God designed it. Honor. Biblical word for honor is when I recognize your value, what God made you to be, what your authority that he authorized because he's the author. When that and this and that works together, we call that submission. That's what husband and wives, it's not the one is over the other. We need to redeem this. And you know what? When you bring your life in alignment with what the author authorized your authority to be, that's when you are authentic. Hallelujah.